Fresh Cut with me, Kara Woodstock. I'm the culture editor at Godrepreneur, and we like to get straight to the source, talking to the people on the ground with their hands in the soil who make this industry great. Um, today, I get to welcome Reginald Stanfield, who's the CEO and head horticulturist at Just Incredible Cultivation, LLC. Uh, Just Incredible, he uh, does the growing and works as a CEO, combining his talent for finance and his background in cultivation. Um, and he joined right after uh, founding multiple businesses. So let's just jump in. I want to hear a little bit about how you started at farming and cultivation. Well, uh, thank you for the great intro. It was dope. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it, it's, it was in my family. We were farmers. We, we've done it for generations. So when I was as old enough to walk, I was in some type of dirt, dealing with some type of plant. So it kind of just bled over into cannabis and we just kept letting the momentum go. And it wasn't your interest as a team. You kind of had a talent and a mind for finance. And when most kids were reading like Goosebumps books, you were out there reading business novels. And I'm curious, when did that entrepreneurial spirit guide you towards the cannabis industry? Yeah, so it's weird because I, I was going to be a stockbroker until Enron hit. So I, I got away from entrepreneur, uh, just loving the market and loving trading, loving stocks, uh, winning games for high schools, you know, being doing a lot of first then. So with cannabis, it came over a time where we were doing multiple businesses. I love business in itself. I love developing businesses. I love entering markets, studying markets, finding niches, finding targets. Uh, and actually, it came with tragedy. When a hurricane hit in Houston, one of my businesses where we had kind of went all in to expand in Houston, uh, and we were forced to pivot, and that pivot wasn't as strong. So we were having to do other businesses that we didn't quite enjoy as owners because, you know, that's why we're entrepreneurs and do what we enjoy. And then Massachusetts had popped up like, hey, you know, we're getting ready to drop the applications. And, I, you know, I, I read about it. I said, hey, man, I mean, we can we can get one. Let's go. And we just decided then and there. And there's other reasons, right? Massachusetts was attractive because you don't have roots there. You moved around a lot, but never to that specific state. Like what was attractive about the way Massachusetts built their industry to your team? 100%. So while other uh, states kind of let it a free for all, you know, Massachusetts is one of the first states with a social equity program, uh, even though we we're not a, a social equity or economic empowerment applicant. I just thought the state had, you know, smaller business more in mind. They uh, put wattage caps to, you know, kind of stop the huge people from just coming in and dominating the market. They also put tier restrictions uh, that gave us a fighting chance as well. And they didn't do a ranking point system uh, competition for applications. They just, hey, put in your application. And if you're good enough, you know, if you meet all of our requirements, you can operate. And that's how any industry should be in America, uh, not this point system nonsense that they do in a lot of states. Absolutely. That really feels like a way people, those states are gaming the system to their advantage to pick the businesses they want. But um, did you seek out investors for Just Incredible? And what was your approach? What was that experience like? Uh, yeah, we definitely have investors. Uh, cultivation is probably the most cap uh, capital needy business to start. You have a lot of uh, upfront costs. You have a lot of construction costs. And then also you have a lot of risk. So we did definitely go out there and get investors. You just pitch, you know, for me, pitch everybody I have contact with, call people that may know people. I'm not from a highly, you know, wealthy environment. So for us, a lot of people we know are living for, you know, their houses, living for their families. So we just pitch every and anybody, tried our best to take any type of capital that we could, any type of equity that we could. And we found great partners. Uh, you know, I would like to say we made the best deal every single time, but our focus was just getting open. And, you know, that's, that's what we did. Yeah. And are you still able to maintain some autonomy as a business and kind of like, um, keep your own goals 
while still having those investors. It feels like you have that small business um, freedom while still having invested in team behind you. How did you manage that? That seems well, well, special. The, yeah. Well, the good thing about it was, uh, you know, we my, my management group, uh, we still own majority control of the company, but also that's just being 100 percent upfront and not selling yourself too much to investors. You know, you want you want investors that match your goal and your mindset and also with your creativity. For me, I'm a very fast uh, mover. I'm a very fast shaker. I go for high goals. I understand there are low, hang, low hanging fruit that a lot of people like to attack. But for, you know, I have a knack for going for it all. So. I had investors who understood. And then we also made a plan that was realistic to make that go happen and not, you know, not just go ahead and shoot for the moon day one or year one. It was, you know, what's the best way to get to where we want to be. Uh, and that's what I tell all entrepreneurs. You don't have to limit your overall goal. You know, you should just be realistic in how you approach that goal. Do you think that has a lot to do with your talent for finance? combining with cultivation, that level-headed mindset as you continue to forge forward with Just Incredible? A hundred percent. I mean, a lot of people like to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Uh, business is business. You know, if, if if you can look back in time and see the likelihood of something failing and something succeeding, you should place yourself on the succeeding aspect. If you're, you know, I understand marijuana is something new in America, but we had prohibition before of alcohol. Uh, we had certain markets coming online. We have things going from lightly restricted to restricted or heavily restricted or different, not restricted like tobacco. Um, I, I'm just a student of, of the game. And if you follow the numbers, you can clearly see what, you know, the cannabis industry is doing. And that also ties into your first question. Massachusetts has a lot of great things about it. You know, have a lot of what you call luxury spending has a lot of the uh, higher price uh, tier one colleges, uh, rich neighborhoods. You have a lot of population, even when it comes to winter months, you have a lot of tourist uh, attractions. So Massachusetts on the East Coast being the first recreational market, it was prime for, for people to enter. I live in Washington, um, which came online in 2012. And I feel kind of kindred with Massachusetts because it's sort of like a sleeping giant where, like you said, there's tourism, there's a big market, but it's not one of these like big uh, you must watch this state in the news every day. Um, whereas like you're, the industry here is it's moving along, but like, it's not that heavily talked about Colorado over here on the West coast um, or California is huge in news, but Massachusetts seems like this really cool industry that we don't get a lot of coverage of. So it's, it's, I feel like your understanding of the market really led you to a, a good state that other Definitely. people might be sleeping on. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, if you look towards the West Coast, you see the market almost become a free for all in the second and third year. You know, you see them blossoming from a couple, a hundred or two businesses to thousands within four years, like Colorado and like, uh, you, you know, Oregon, where Massachusetts in itself, we're still at 120, maybe, I think we're 57, yeah, maybe 120, 150 businesses. And this is our third year. Uh, also we had COVID, but still to think, you know, we're two and a half years and we're only at 150 businesses. The, that does great in allowing smaller businesses to grow and also allowing the market to stay attractive and high demand. But eventually this market is going to blossom and that's when you'll have people scrambling for market control. Yeah. And I think a lot of the states talk about like California, there's going to be mass acquisition where mm -hmm. that might not be the case in places like Massachusetts. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, you mentioned heavy construction cost, and I read a little bit about the company. I know you've done a lot of work with the community, specifically like building utilities and um, community involvement has always been a cornerstone for Just Incredible. Can you talk about some of the projects you're involved in and how the involvement really lend, lent to the growth of the business? Uh, definitely. Just uh, working with the landowner that, that we have. Uh, was was a big thing. We we kind of added to our cost by getting some of the things from the town and construction from the town. But more for us, since we're in our first year, it's just making sure that you listen to the town, even if you can't be active in which just incredible will be active, especially after COVID leaving, we'll be able to get more into the community and see what they do as a small 
close enough community. But what you have to do if you can't do it that way, you have to listen to the community and give them what they want. You know, they if they want certain hours to be respected, it's quiet time. They don't want a lot of lights and certain things that each community would have that they would ask for business. And especially if you're outside, you should definitely listen in. Yeah. Um, despite all of this work, going to town halls and community involvement, are you still planning to move from Cummington to a new location? Uh, well, we're, we're trying our best to work with Cummington. Uh, nice. They have, they have some uh, caps that make, uh, you know, make it being realistic for us to stay there. So currently, you know, Massachusetts allows us to have three different licenses. Uh, we will be seeking uh, a license in a new town, uh, regardless of what happens in Cummington. We're going to uh, we're at a heavy expansion model right now. So we're going to go and open up two more licenses and try to get uh, big because, you know, black cannabis needs to be represented all across uh, mass. And currently right now we don't have the size to do it. And we're going to make sure we can by, you know, 2022. Have you had any challenges? Um Sorry, my cat just went right through. <laughs> Have you had any challenges working with the town in Cummington? Uh, of course, we have challenges uh, working with the town. It's a small town where we're starting a new industry where sometimes the laws and regulations can be kind of easy to misunderstand. So, yes, we had a lot of challenges, uh, you know, I'm a person that likes to harp on positivity and po uh, progress. So once obstacles are done, I kind of deconnect from them. Uh, we're open, you know what I mean? That's that's really all that matters is that we're here. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, I think the biggest challenge would just be the learning curve. Yeah, teaching the town about cannabis business specifically. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, the demographics of the town are predominantly white and you're coming in with a team of black executives. Has that lent to any of the maybe disconnect in conversation as you've tried to build this community focus uh, program? There's when when you're when you're working so tirelessly towards a goal, you kind of keep your head down. So are there signs of it? Yes. There's a hundred percent signs that, you know, we had uh, racial issues bleeding across from older uh, select board members or building inspectors and wiring inspectors. So yeah, there has been a lot of, you know, now I wanna say a lot, but there has been instances where we see that there is some of uh, things that should not happen in business leak, you know, leak over. But I will say that just like we have the negativity, we also have a lot of support from the town and even down, you know, at places like the creamery uh, and some of the still older folks support us and call us every day saying that we love what you guys are doing. Um, and in, in this world, in this time right now, we're focused so much on hate that it is, it's obvious, you know, you go into a predominantly white town that is 900 residents, old values that you will find that, you know, you'll find it anywhere. But I like to shine a light on a place like that being very open minded to different ideals, different lifestyles. And people actually did come out to support us when we asked for them to. That's awesome. That's great to hear. Um, let's get to the fun plant stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have a specific set of genetics. Uh, what genetics do you currently grow at Just Incredible and how what goes into choosing these phenos? Yeah, so we're, we're really getting into the choice of our genetics now. Uh, a lot of people know if they read our story that we actually got shut down uh, on the day we were supposed to get inspected for uh, COVID for, you know, six to eight months. So we did lose all of our original genetics. Oh, no. um, but uh, luckily, you know, we have help. Uh, one of the big winners from 420 was Jelly Breath. They love that. It's a, a Mendo Breath cross. Uh, everybody has really loved that. It's a great thing. You know, it's very uh, good on the terpene profile, beautiful on the no uh, nose. It's a nice, clean smoke. Uh, it's one of those active highs. I've I've been playing around with growing it a little bit longer so that you can get more of the uh, pain relief feeling, more of the anxiety uh, relaxation that you can get uh, from a plant that is a sativa dominant that's been pushed a little bit further on and uh, flower. And I think that's what gives us a, a edge as a smaller business that can't scale is that they're, you know, the the suits, as people call it, will be, you know, cultivators will be made up of those who started as a non 
who, you know what I mean, who were in the trenches, as people say, we're building the building, we're, you know, understand the plan is a user, it's not just a business model. Uh, so yeah, our genetics, we have uh, one of our staples, Garrett Morgan Gas Mask, is one of my creation. It's a, a Granetti Perb Cross with a uh, uh, king jab and I'm, I'm not going to throw in my last plan because it's kind of like okay. my favorite, my stabilization, but I love it. Big colas, nice, uh, clean smoke. It, it'll get you for, I've seen it have two effects, get people really, really drowsy and sleepy. And then some, you know, talkative and giggly. So I love that one. Um, and then we got, you know, one of them and we tell people it's called, uh, they like to read and say it's Kobe, but it's actually uh, how, you know, in our, our community, when you go to do a jump shot, I go Kobe. Mm-hmm. So we have a strand that uh, is named after him. Uh, one of my idols growing up, somebody that I follow and that I believe in the mama mentality, hundred percent. So this plant right here, we feel embodies it. Those are great terpenes, you know, beautiful colors. It can, you know, sometimes throw a lot of orange and, and bright reds into it and give you uh, a more like body encompassing spacey high. And, and I, I feel like those, you know, so those are just some of the select ones. Uh, we categorize our strands in three different tiers of exclusivity um, because there's no reason to grow terrible plants. <laughs> I mean, so I, I never understood a, uh, a grow saying this is our you know, bronze, gold. No, it's like we grow everything here with love, with the same type of care. So it's more so how much we're dropping. Uh, We have things, you know, we'll have our vintage tier that some of the older people, some of the older smokers will love, you know, the nostalgia of White Widows, getting back into the Blue Dream, the Northern Lights, the Super Silver Hazes, you know, some of the old things and not some of these crosses and wild names mixes that, you know, some, some generations just don't want to touch. Uh, then we have our Just Incredible uh, tier, where is our stable tier. You know, Just Incredible is the strain that leads that one. Uh, we have a lot of different names in that one, Tardis, Black Mama. And then we have our Just in a Lifetime that we're dropping regionally and we're dropping uh, seasonally. So, you know, maybe out the Cape, you, you'll get a, a, a strand that you can't find all the way out East Mass. So we're, we're, we're trying to give a little, a different way to cannabis is not, we're not TC chasing, you know, I'm not a TC chaser. We're just trying to give somebody great smoke all the way around. That is so nice to hear. I, I look for those original strains to hear that you're growing like a super silver and whatnot is a fantastic thing. And it's really hard to find in the, in the market, at least in my state. Um, those original brands like blue dream was everywhere in San Francisco Bay area. when I started bud tending and I'm sure people are always looking for it. Um, I do have a question that might put you on spot. It's kind of a controversial one, but how do you feel about Indica sativa labeling and how there's this disconnect because as a bud tender on the retail side, it's the easiest way to access what your customer is looking for or your patient is looking for. But scientifically there's a lot of argument that it's incorrect so um what are you all doing in terms of that labeling and like personally just what do you believe would be a good way to move forward from those more simple monikers yeah so you you can get technical about things um and what I believe in cannabis is cannabis is not is not supposed to be that, you know, we're not supposed to be over here arguing around the technical aspects of a word or not a word that just not when you when you're talking about getting away from the culture it's not so far as who grows it or or stuff like that or even how it's grown it's stuff like that, you know, getting away from the culture about oh this is indica oh no it's not a ton no scientific no. We all believe in indica sativa because it's the most easiest way to classify strands and by their characteristics. Um, There's a scientific way, whereas in, you know, our CB1 and CB3 uh, reflectors, they're going to, no matter what you do, who you are, they're going to be different. You know, the indica for you can make you feel in the couch. A sativa for me can make me feel in the couch. So it honestly, it doesn't matter when you can't grow a plant the same way every single time, no matter what, it's like a snowflake. So we just, I don't think anybody cares. I think once you break it down in a blunt or put it in a bowl or put it in a vaporizer, all you care about is what the effects, um, what you have. And if you're a bud tender and you know that strand, then you know, it doesn't matter if you call the indica sativa, it's about what it gives and how it is. And if it helps the consumers 
who aren't scientists <laughs> understand, okay, well, if they say this is an indica, then more than likely it's going to get me in the couch. So maybe we're not characteristic uh, putting a label on the strands. We're putting the label on the effect of the strands. So mm-hmm. let's, let's maybe, you know, that's a cool way to think about calling it instead of saying, you know, science, you know, scientifically A, B, and C about the nature of the plant. Well, how about we're just categorizing, well, that plant is a knockout plant. That plant is an upper plant, you know, and we call knockouts indica, we call it upper sativa. So I think maybe we get into that, that light with it. It's a, you know, it's, it's a better way. Yeah, I agree. Um, I do want to know if you're willing to share what type of grow medium you use at the cultivation and yeah. like just a little more about how you how you grow because you're indoor, correct? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So we we used to run with a, a hybrid soil cocoa mix, uh, but Massachusetts has extremely tough uh, testing regulations, and it saw me cut out a lot of my organic uh, practices that I used to love to do. Uh, a and shame. so we're yeah. It, I mean, it is a shame, but it's it's hard to ask for a thousand percent testing and making sure people are always getting 100% right bud and then also incur the cost of, you know, growing in organic and having certain bacteria in your plants. So if the consumers is wanting a highly regulated market because cannabis is this commodity that needs to be super regulated, then they have to understand that we're going to do things more uh, chemically based instead of more organic based. Uh, Some companies won't do that. Some companies will stick with their patterns, but in Massachusetts, I sent a lot of us go over to straight cocoa or, or uh, rock will um, to get out of the soil. You know, you, the heavy metal test, the, the different, the different microbiology, it, it just makes it a little bit harder to the function of soil. Yeah. And that actually leads me. I'm curious um, what role testing plays in developing your product in releasing new strains Um You have mentioned before that testing does play quite a role in just how you all operate. Yeah. I mean, in everybody, we're a business first. At the end of the day, we have to pass testing Mm. or you're talking about a, you know, 85 percent reduction in the price of a a product that you just spent two and a half months growing. So, you know, we're not you're not going to have a lot of businesses that just keep rolling the dice with a plan, you know, gets unhappy and uptakes too much cash. You know what I mean? That can happen in soil because it can actually go find it and, and stack it, even if it's in very low qualities in our medium. So you're not going to get growers keep running that risk when they have to repay investors or they have to expand. It costs a lot of money for us to expand. If we do care about the people and we don't short staff, we have a lot of staff. So you're you're talking about having to make sure income comes in <laughs> while you also, you know what I mean, make good product. Uh, the consumer also has to understand that with testing, a lot of companies are drying out their products so that they make sure that all bacteria, yeast and mold is killed. So when you're getting, you know, oh, well, their butt is very dry and this and that, you have to understand that's what the best practice so they don't have to hit your plant with a pre-remediation. It doesn't have to go through, you know, ozone treatment or go through whatever treatment that company uses before it gets to you. Yeah. The, the, the other reset, the other, you know, compromise is a dry. Um, and if you do, if you are getting dry, but then maybe just throw a humidity pack in there, you know what I mean? And then don't complain as much because, <laughs> you know, if they didn't have, they're not, I, I don't think any huge company is going to overdraw their cannabis for fun. You yeah, know what I mean? They're not, they're not just, yeah, it's not, it's the best way for them. And these companies, you know, you have companies like Cureleaf who are employing a lot of people, giving a lot of chances, trying to give away a lot of money, trying to do a lot of programs. And they're getting trash as a big MSO when, you know, they have to, you know, this the reason why they're drawing out the cannabis so they can keep, you know, things that have passed so that they can keep doing these great things. They can't give away $100,000, you know, to multiple companies if they are failing tests. So if you, you know, you have to kind of have a conversation with yourself. What do you guys want to do as far as testing? Do you want to know all the you know bacteria in your plant? What is the limit? You know what I mean? What is the limit? Do you, would you like to spend some of that tax dollars and put it towards research for that instead of, you know, towards schools and hospitals and things like that? So when it comes down to pick your representatives and people who will vote and decide these factors, you might want to ask them, hey, if I have a recreational legal cannabis in my state, what are you doing with those dollars? How can we budget? You know, is this automatically trapped in the first act or the first bill that was wrote or do we get to decide you have to figure that out for your state and just don't you know i'm pretty sure 
they can step up the quality uh, just by if you up the restrictions on testing, then you're going to see an upswing in product across uh, almost every market that you that you see bigger companies having lower what you would say quality. For me, it kind of begs the question: Is this plant able to be scaled so high as an MSO is trying to grow it? Um, or does this plant require more of like a artist artisanal growing focus? Like, can you grow super dank, sticky flour at such a large scale as some of the MSOs are attempting to? Is that possible? Well, I mean, no, I, I, I don't think you can. If you're talking about the upper echelon type cannabis that went yeah. up, probably not. You're, I mean, but that's just that's overall business and economics you're you're talking you don't see a lamborghini putting out three thousand cars every year it's just not what they do so how can you get something that is handcrafted by a skill set that has to be learned over years and then you expect for it to be put out where that mso has to make a dollar amount of line so that means they're gonna have a certain amount of cultivators and this plant needs to be in a certain type of medium that it doesn't has a higher fail to, so no, you know, bottom line is if you're smaller and you're growing, let's say 10,000 square feet, you can, your, your debt to income uh, ratio, your expense to income ratio is going to be easier to manipulate. You know what I mean? When you have less investors in the pot and shareholders in the pot, or if you are the main owner of the company is about your happiness and then everybody else is going along with your dream. So if, you know, you can make those certain decisions, like for me, I have, I can make certain decisions that a big MSO CEO will have to consider all of the board with me is just, Hey, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to focus on. And do you guys agree to come along with this ride? Because if not, then we won't take your money. You know what I mean? I think some of those huge MSOs are beyond that thought. They are about expansion and they're growing. You know, you don't go into Walmart expecting to buy $10,000 worth of diamonds. It's okay. And you know what I mean? If you, if you want to go buy $10,000 worth of diamonds, you go, you might fly somewhere, you know, where you have a specialist give it to you. But do, every time you jewelry shop, do you want $10,000 worth of diamond no um, every time you go to get a bottle of liquor do you want to buy a two thousand dollar bottle of liquor no not every occasion calls for that you need your you know your middle class growers like to call them your average you know decent weed and and they can grow high quality decent weed at, at those levels you know but if you're talking your upper craft super super crazy stuff then no but that's why they shouldn't even try they should allow the craft growers to be the craft growers um and then we as consumers have to accept that if you're going to get super high craft growers then the price per ounce or price per uh 3.5 gram doesn't need to change you know we need to accept that it's 75 dollars for a 3.5 from a craft grower that is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. If you want a plant, you know what I mean? Because that's what you're getting. It, just because the whole entire market might have a lot of weed in it, that doesn't mean that the craft should, you know, because it's not a lot of the craft weed in it. So yeah. we have to accept that this industry needs to just not go by how much available cannabis is. And all that comes with more knowledge, more people understanding how to smoke, what to smoke, when, you know, it's, it's right now with just a Oh, go get weed. And then it's an, every new market is like, I think I should get the best because these people are professionals. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, well, no, are they, you know, they're not craft. If they're not craft, then you're not going to get the best. So if you're going to go get something that is, you know, what you call, I would say seaweed, then why are you upset as of getting seaweed if you're paying $40 or, or $55 an eighth? I mean, it just has to come with understanding the market. And I would have to say I was at fault of this <laughs> when I wasn't in the actively in the market and I was going around to Colorado. I was at fault for it, but I also was willing to pay, you know, seventy five dollars for that top. And if I didn't, I understood what I was getting for my quality. Yeah, it reminds me of beer where you can go get a 30 rack of Budweiser or you can get a six pack of craft beer yep. um, in Massachusetts. As you mentioned, it, it seems like the laws and regulations have maintained space for craft growers and possibly MSOs. So it's creating that diversity of the market where some, some states aren't saving space for those craft growers as much. Um, so 
Let's talk about where people can find your products. I saw on LinkedIn recently that you launched a couple of new stores on 420, which is very exciting. Um, yeah, where in Massachusetts are your products available? So currently right now, we were making our huge push uh, for 420 to drop exclusively in Cura Leaf and uh, Elevate Cannabis. Uh, personally, that was the decision made because those are the two brands that have supported Just Incredible um, throughout all of our all of our time, you know, well, now I want to say throughout all of our cure leave came at the very end, but they did do a huge uh, thing for us. So we wanted to show our, our mutual respect and then showing that, Hey, we believe cure leave is a company out there that is trying to do good. They have their rooted in good initiative. So we respect it. You know, we wanted to drop exclusively with them. And then we wanted to drop uh, exclusively with elevate uh, Shay Wuna a data G is a uh, really great colleague of mine. He is like a brother to me. Um, we, we have a super, tight bond and he is as well has done some amazing things for just incredible so we wanted to to give these two people the exclusivity of the product within the next month we'll be you know over at almost 30 stores across the city like sierra naturals we'll be at a major bloom when they open um in may i think they should be open in may 20th you got to look out for uh, them we're going to be at new dia we'll be at all the stores across mass and as soon as they drop that delivery license you have to look uh look through us, uh, for us through Rolling Leaf. Uh, Rolling Leaf will definitely be one of the places we have as a delivery service. So we'll be we'll be everywhere. We want to get to you guys by the end of 2021 um, to every one of your stores. But just know Just Incredible is only dropping small packages. So if you if we put we drop, then you might be, you know, it might be 100 units, 200 units, 300 units, but they go fast. So definitely you got to jet over there wherever we put it. We'll, we'll release on our social media a list of stores every time we, you know, we hit a new one. That is a challenge for a lot of farms and retail shops, um, keeping things on the shelves so that the people who love that product can keep getting it regularly. Um, are those small drops sort of a way for the team to maintain inventory to be able to continue supplying retailers? Well, we're just we're just a small operator right now, just to yeah. be honest with you. Uh, so we're not, you know, right now, this is a teaser. Next year, we are going huge. You know, we're, we're getting ready to build out a uh, 45,000 square foot canopy. Uh, so we'll be almost 500 uh, percent bigger than uh, we what we are now. So we're just getting you guys ready for what Just Incredible will be. So we can just consider this whole year a soft launch, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> and then next year, you know, we're going to drop the big boy and start dropping, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds on the market. And then you'll be able to get us at, at a long, a long time, you know, for anywhere. We're going to we're going to try to be at every single store that that holds product and mass. So that's, that's our that goal. big shot. Big, uh, yeah. big dreams that you're yeah. talking about earlier. I like it. Definitely, definitely. You know, it's a balance. <laughs> yep. Um, is it currently just flower or are there uh, more diversity in the product line? Yeah, so Just Incredible is only going to give you guys pre-roll and flower. Great. Um, we are not greedy. We know what we're good at. We probably could do uh, edibles and tinctures, but we're just incredible. And all we care about is the flower. Yeah. And maybe one day you wholesale when you have all that those pounds and pounds yeah yeah someone yeah. who's real good at edibles <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean oh and i mean we do have a couple of uh, brands that will be releasing edibles so um right. we'll drop we'll, you know we'll drop those soon as soon as they get online we're just waiting for more black owned uh manufacturers so when we get more black owned manufacturers then we'll team up with edibles and we'll team up with tinctures but right now we're gonna we're gonna wait for that <laughs> yeah i'm glad you mentioned that because i know it's a important part of the mission of the brand is to grow the the black owned businesses within Massachusetts and the cannabis industry was founded by black and brown people entrepreneurs before it was even legal so um, how are you focused as an individual and as a team on continuing to build more black and brown ownership in the cannabis industry uh, well that's a great question uh so I'm, I'm doing it on a two front. Just Incredible is going to actively work and partner exclusively with brands that either support black and brown people or are made up of those people. So you can't you can't beg for inclusion and unity and then say, oh, we're only going to work with these people, but we're only going to work with our supporters and also women. Um, I have three daughters. We'll have four soon. Uh, I am a I my COO is a woman. My CFO is a woman. You know, my mom is my best friend. I am a supporter of 
women, uh, 100%. So any company that is not for those that group, you know, doesn't support that group, then we're not we're not doing business with them. We're people before profit uh, on that front. And then also on another front, I am vice president of a uh, organization that will be released very, very soon uh, that is made up not of activists and not of people who are uh, social media people, but actually black and brown operators in the Massachusetts and other markets. So you guys be on the lookout for this uh, this brand coming with this organization coming soon. We're still uh, getting the last little bits of our charter and stuff settled. But, you know, I am VP of that organization. And my uh, my pledge or my duty is to make as many uh, black and brown operators and to lower the bar of entry for uh, for people who are usually excluded from this market. Yeah. And people who founded the market, essentially. Definitely. Um, <clears throat> are you planning any new product lines or seeking any new phenos right now? I know we touched on that a little bit. Oh yeah. I mean, we, we're always, that's just the fun of it. You know, being a cultivator, you get to geek out. We have over 300 phenotypes. I mean, and strands in our, in our role. You make them. You're, yeah. you're also breeding. Yeah. Yeah. So I work with a, a couple of people uh, throughout the state, me and uh, Marcus of Rebel, we're working on something. So you'll see something just for the Berkshire drop very soon. Uh, once, you know, once we get past our first year mark, then we'll have a lot of fun. We'll be able to play around with a lot of phenos, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, growing and just just get into it. But right now we have enough just to keep you guys, uh, you know, happy for, for a year at least. Absolutely. Um is there any other place that we can find you or uh, do you want to drop the website or the socials so that people can make sure to find your brand or you in general? Definitely. Uh, so you can find us at uh, Justin. I'm sorry. That's not, I keep giving my email. Uh, the website <laughs> is jccultivation.com. That's uh, where you can go in there and inquire about, even if you're looking for jobs or just figure out about learning about the C-suite. Our Instagram is uh, just incredible underscore cultivation. You can go in there. We kind of post, we have people talking back to people, commenting all the time. Uh, my personal Facebook, uh, not Facebook, my personal Instagram is Forest Next. Uh, you can look for me on there. I mean, I'm not really on social media that much, but when I do get on, I'll comment back. I definitely love to get advice about growing. If you just want to uh, just reach out to me and say, hey, what's this going on with my plant? I respond a lot of times because um, I like looking at people's plants. So, and then you might have something that I, I can learn from. So if you want to reach out to me about the plant, it's the quickest way to get me to talk to you because I love the plant. <laughs> I love, you know, I love the actual that cannabis plant so definitely reach out yeah and prohibition that was how how growers kept in touch it's how how the plant continued to evolve because growers were in this underground network talking to, to each other about what they were doing so i love yeah, that no, keeping no. that tradition alive <laughs> oh yeah you got to man just because we're you know i'm a ceo of a company don't mean i'm i'm anybody but a regular guy who started growing in his closet yeah, you're a hybrid suit and grower. It's nice yeah. <laughs> to see. Um, I do actually, I'm just out of curiosity, do you ever plan to expand outside of Massachusetts or are you staying focused within the state? Oh, no, we're going, Just Incredible is going to take over the United States. You know, <laughs> we're we're going for all. Uh, that's why my name is Forbes Next, because I will be, you know, the next number one on Forbes one of these times. So we're going to go everywhere. Uh, you'll, you'll also see me in different brands and different companies. I love cannabis, but business is my passion. Uh, once COVID stops, you'll see us go full forward for Masters of Mixology, going to different states. So, you know, New York is coming online. We're, we're going super heavy in New York. So is New Jersey. I'm actually visiting both states in the next month and I'm going out Montana too. So anywhere that has a cannabis industry, medical or, or uh, recreational, you can see us starting to, we're gonna, we're gonna get there. I hope there I still back. get one day soon in Washington. Yeah. Definitely. Hey, I mean, Washington. We're coming for Washington too. And as soon as they, you know, they, they lower the bar of entry, we'll, we'll yeah. spread everywhere. <laughs> Hard to break in. Um, well, sweet. I'm really excited that you could spend some time with us today. I respect the amount of time you were able to chat. And Definitely. for the listeners, you can tune into Gondrepreneur's YouTube channel for fresh episodes. And if you want to say, sure that you're seeing the newest ones, follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, 
LinkedIn, wherever you get social. I'm Kara Whitstock, the culture editor at Grandpreneur, and I was stoked you could spend time with us today.